It is not in the woods alone to give one this impression of utter loneliness. In the woods are sounds and voices, and a mute kind of companionship. One is little more than a walking tree themselves. But come upon one of these mountain lakes, and the wildness stands revealed, and meets you face to face. Water is thus facile and adaptive, that it makes the wild more wild, while it enhances culture and art. I am forced to conclude that my passion for nature and for all open-air life, though tinged and stimulated by science, is not a passion for pure science, but for literature and philosophy. My imagination and ingrained humanism are appealed to by the facts and methods of natural history. I find something akin to poetry and religion in the shows of day and night and in my excursions to fields and woods. The love of nature is a different thing from the love of science, though the two may go together. To the rigid person of science, this is frank mysticism, but without a sense of the unknown and unknowable, life is flat and barren. Without the emotion of the beautiful, the sublime, the mysterious, there is no art, no religion, no literature. Though the secret of life is under our feet, yet how strange and mysterious it seems. It draws our attention away from matter. We are so immersed in these realities of matter, energy, consciousness, that we do not see the divinity they embody. We call that sacred and divine, which is far off and unattainable. Life and mind are so impossible to be explained in terms of matter and energy that it is no wonder that humans have so long looked upon their appearance upon this earth as a miraculous event. But until science opened our eyes, we did not know that the celestial and the terrestrial are one and that we are already in the heavens among the stars. The migrating wild creatures, whether birds or beasts, always arrest the attention. They seem to link up animal life with the great currents of the globe. It is moving day on a continental scale. It is the call of the primal instinct to increase and multiply, suddenly setting in motion whole tribes and races. One sees the passing bird procession in their own grounds and neighborhood without pausing to think that in every person's grounds and in every neighborhood throughout the world, about several millions of homes and over several millions of farms the same flood tide of bird life is creeping and eddying or sweeping over the land. Nature is a sort of outlying province of ourselves. We feel a kinship with her works. And in bird and beast, in tree and flower, we behold the workings of the same life principle that has brought us where we are and relates us to all living things. Once started in pursuit of nature lore, we are pretty sure to keep on. When people ask me, how shall we teach our children to love nature? I reply, do not try to teach them at all. Just turn them loose in the country and trust to luck. It is time enough to answer children's questions when they are interested enough to ask them. Knowledge without love does not stick, but if love comes first, knowledge is pretty sure to follow. 
I was born and passed my youth on the farm. A feeling of companionship with nature came long prior to any conscious desire for accurate and specific knowledge about her works. I loved the flowers and the wild creatures, as most healthy children do. Long before I knew there was such a study as botany or natural history. The book of nature is always open winter and summer and is always within reach and the print is legible if we have eyes to read it. But most persons are too preoccupied to have their attention arrested by it. Our interest in nature is a reflection of our interest in ourselves. Nature is ourselves extended and seen externally. Wait long enough and nature will always have a fresh surprise for you. We have no name for the reasoning of insects but instinct, untaught wisdom. But in some cases it is so far beyond anything that humans attain to except after long research and experimentation that we marvel at it as we would at the supernatural. O oh, strange and baffling nature, truly thy ways are not as our ways. But nature keeps the game of life going, which seems her main purpose, making it as various and picturesque as possible. The intelligence of the insect is the intelligence of nature. It is action and not reflection. Nature lives and grows and does not pause to cogitate and ask the reason why, as we do. Her works are a perpetual revelation. Oh, that wisdom that grows on trees, that murmurs in the streams, that floats in the wind, that sings in the birds, that is fragrant in the flowers, that speaks in the storms. The wisdom that one gathers on the shore or when sauntering in the fields or in resting under a tree. The wisdom that makes a person forget their science and exacts only their love. How precious it all is.